Can you hear me okay? I guess you can. I've been talking very loudly here the last hour and maybe a little hoarse on it. But uh, nice to be here and uh, as was mentioned, I'm, I'm the grandson of uh, Llewellyn and Avis that uh, restored uh, the property here. I grew up in Long Beach. I live in Oregon now. Uh, I think you probably know my two cousins much better, uh, uh, Jean uh, Smith and uh, Barbara Blackwell, who are out here fairly frequently and live in Long Beach and uh, uh, take care of things here at the Rancho uh, on, on many occasions. Uh, before heading off any further, let me just shout out a big thanks to all of you. Uh, and it's not because you're here to hear me, but because you're the volunteers. Uh, it's a very important role, and it's neat to see so many people involved uh, behind the scenes or up front or wherever you are, because that's what makes the, the Rancho hum and get better all the time. I think back in 1960 when there really were no volunteers around here, and much, different, uh, much different world. And with the things that are going on with this water project and various other things, it's uh, absolutely amazing what, uh, what uh, will be occurring, I think, in the future here and, and bringing the Los Cerritos more into the community, uh, which is still my, my appreciation, really, for what you all do and, uh, on it. Uh, Uh, what I'm going to kind of talk about, and questions are ultimately welcome here, is a little bit about my time here. I've, I've basically spent my entire life around this place, and uh, I brought one picture where this isn't a picture show, and uh, it's not a picture that you even need to see too much. But, uh, this is a, a little curly-headed kid sitting on a blanket, and, and if I were going to locate a couple of pictures, blanket was right out there. Uh, and the thing that's uh, maybe more concerning to me is the fact that the date on this picture is February uh, 21st, 1942. Uh, so in a few more days, it'll be 80 years ago that picture was taken. So it's, it's amazing how time goes by to think uh, what has happened here. Although it's interesting, uh, in many ways, the Las Cerritos is the same as I always remember it. The Morton Bay Fig is uh, about nine times bigger. <laughs> and some trees have died, but basically the, the whole ambiance here it hasn't changed too much. And uh, in thinking about it, uh, you know, I, I look at a picture, of which you've all seen here, of, of, of the rancho taken in 1872, right where we are. This is looking at right where we're sitting right now. Uh, basically right you know, in the corner there. Uh, and that was 80 years before, when I started looking at these about 1950, that was 80 years before then. And it's amazing just to think of the absolute changes that occurred in that prior 80 year period. Uh, when you think about it, this was in the middle of certainly nowhere uh, uh, at, at that time. And it's also interesting that uh, in that picture, uh, in the ensuing 80 years, I don't think anybody in that picture was alive. So. We're fortunate that uh, now we live that lengthier period. Uh, my time around here, say, literally started from day one. Uh, and what I want to kind of comment on, there are about four intervals of my involvement here. Not all equal, but a little bit different, each one. The, uh, the, the first time, of course, was, was the time of this picture. Uh, grandparents lived here. Uh, activities were going on. People came. Uh, there weren't normal things that happen around the, the place. But in just a month before that picture was taken, Feb uh, in January of 1942, my grandfather died. So that was a, a transition time for the place here. Certainly some of the activity that uh, went on uh, started to tone down a little bit. People came, we had, I know from pictures and so forth, the family was still out here. Uh, and then in the middle of, uh, Oh, the war time, uh, 1943 or four, uh, my grandmother moved on down to the Villa Riviera, and uh, I suspect she felt she rattled around this house, but also keep in mind fuel rationing, and she was getting older too, and my, my guess is that uh, it made sense to move down there. And the other problem was friends <coughs> coming out here, they had the same issue driving out here. So um, after that point, things really slowed down, although this was the uh, family orchard. 
Uh, we lived over on Locust Avenue, just a few blocks away, so we were here frequently for oranges and tangerines and lemons and avocados and, and uh, zapotes that my father particularly liked. Uh, he was one of the few in the family that used to relish those, and he fought the possums for them. <laughs> quite a few of those around here. But uh, it, uh, it was, uh, we were out here quite a bit, but yet the house was uh, still va vacated. And uh, of course, I don't remember that early era for obvious reasons, but there are a lot of pictures of, of coming, uh, coming out here. Uh, the first memories I have of the place uh, here probably were in, oh, late 45. And I can remember two things in particular. There's one holding a basket while one of the adults picked, particularly off of the tree that used to be right there, which is a wonderful tangerine tree. Uh, holding the basket while one of the adults would reach up and pick something and put it in. I remember that. The other thing I remember is right where I'm standing, uh, there was rattan mats on the floor, and uh, right uh, by the doorway there we had a basket of toys and good things, and uh, we used to have a little pinball uh, gadget where you set it up here and you roll the ball out, to, you, you hit the pin, and I used to play that. For, and I can remember just as clearly as can be uh, on the floor here playing that, and I wasn't obviously that old. Fun thing about some of those toys is we kept them, and they've come back to the Los Cerritos. They're in the collection now. So uh, the pinball machine was returned a couple of years ago, but my brother happened to have that, and uh, they were moving, and so I got it uh, uh, aimed, aimed in this direction. Uh, that kind of, uh, as we got towards uh, early 46, that kind of closed out my real early years. Uh, but it's interesting, and just driving here today uh, brought back a memory uh, that I have from that era, and that's driving uh, on Lakewood Boulevard uh, by Pacific Coast Highway, where the Douglas plant used to be. I can remember driving by that, and I can remember on the roof having the netting and having trees up there. And I, you know, I guess the reason I remember, that was a bizarre thing to think about. <laughs> trees growing on the top of a big building. But I, I can remember seeing that just as clearly as can be. So there's fleeting memories that we all have when we're four years old or five years old that, that come back to you. My, uh, uh, my father was a geologist and a consulting geologist, and he got uh, uh, involved in a project that uh, he was going to be doing up in Montana. And uh, in early, uh, early 46, uh, he agreed to do it, and we moved uh, actually to Billings, Montana in mid-46, and it was going to be about 15 months, so we were gone. And then, uh, as it turned out, I started kindergarten there, and that's another place I remember some fun, fun things about. And uh, as it turned out, he got the project done in about nine months, so we came back to Long Beach, but we didn't have a house. Uh, our house on Locust Avenue had been uh, leased out to, uh, I think, Mr. Hatton, I think was his name, he was the Packard dealer here in town, and he built a house on Virginia Road that's still here, it's the second one on the west side coming off of San Antonio Drive. Uh, that was behind our house, and so he was building that, and he obviously couldn't move into the new house, and he'd rented, they'd rented our house, so where else would you move but back to the Los Cerritos? <laughs> and uh, there was furniture in here. Uh, we uh, uh, moved, moved in without really any problem because we'd stored some of our furniture, and so life once again resumed here at the Las Cerritos. Uh, I started first grade at the Las Cerritos school. Uh, it was a long walk, so Arthur, the caretaker that you heard about, uh, I went in his Model A. He dropped me off in the morning and picked me up in the afternoon. Uh, uh, he enjoyed, I think, having the additional life around here because he was, you know, the, the, we had a, a sort of a housekeeper cook that was here with us, and uh, so he got to eat in the, uh, here with home-cooked food, which he liked. Uh, and, and during the you know, days in the summer and whatever, uh, I spent a lot of time with him, and that's when I really got to know Arthur. And as some of you, as some of you know, uh, uh, you know, Arthur was sort of a substitute grandfather for me, a very delightful and smart guy that uh, uh, was, I think, enjoyed having me around, and so we worked together on a lot of things. If he was tinkering on something, I'd, I'd look over his shoulder and so on. So we had a, a, a good relationship, and, and that continued up until a little before Thanksgiving of 1946. And then we moved back into our house uh, over on Locust Avenue. From that time on, then uh, 
uh, which would be from about then until 1955, which was a big date for here. That's when the city took over. Uh, we were nearby and over here frequently. Uh, I rode my bike over. Uh, as you can imagine, this was a great playground. And so I'd bring friends over. Uh, we had trees to climb. We'd walk around the perimeter wall if we could get up there somewhere. We were on the water tower. Uh, <laughs> you'd be surprised where we were. <laughs> uh, of course, uh, in the early days, the houses weren't around here. You could walk out through the century plants if you could find a way to get through it, one that maybe died, and up on the hill there. And then it was fair game down into the clear to the golf course area. And uh, there was really nothing uh, down there except a lot of fun places to explore. Uh, the Virginia Road had a barrier right at the entrance of the rancho here. Uh, it used to go further as the old road down across the, the river. But uh, so that was grown up and grown over and you can go down there and uh, there were some bluffs over above the golf course you could wander around and there was a drainage area when it rained. Uh, uh, we'd go down there and see if we could cross over without getting water in our boots. We had boots that went up to our knees. And, you know, all of the things that uh, you, you had fun, fun doing uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, playing around as a kid. We had, one of the things I remember was we made a miniature golf course uh, out of the paths around the perimeter of the, of the lawn there. Uh, you've got the barriers on either side. It's level gravel. And we, uh, we took uh, little small flower pots and sunk them in for, for the cups. <laughs> so I don't know how many holes we had, but eight or nine holes you just go around because in those days there were shady acres. The golf course that some of you may remember at the, uh, the LA River on Long Beach Boulevard and so we replicated that uh, on it. Uh, and lots of other things happened. I, uh, I was out walking this afternoon and uh, I saw the old well that was capped there and I remember uh, a lot of activity that well was capped because a young uh, young child, a gal as I recall, fell down a well about 1951. And there was a lot to try and get her out and so forth. And as a result, the county said any wells that were not being utilized had to be capped. So that's why that well has a, a cap on it to this day. Uh, before then, we had a big wooden cork that we put in it. Take the cork out, and you drop a rock down, and you go plunk in the water <laughs> down there. So I was always sorry to see to see that uh, particular uh, uh, thing happen. Uh, get rid of our toy that we had there. Another thing that we used to explore is on the, where you parked on the other side of Virginia Road uh, was uh, a canyon. It was the extension of the canyon below the visitor center, and for reasons I don't know, it became a a dump, and not in the sense of a dump you might think of now, but construction material went in it and other good things. And of course, you could go explore those. <laughs> and we did. And brought things back. And uh, one thing that uh, I'm always reminded of, I, we brought back an old pipe wrench, which Arthur and I soaked for a year and a half in kerosene <laughs> to, to get the rust off. And, uh, and we finally got the rust off of it and made it into a functioning pipe wrench again. And to this day, I use it. <laughs> I have it at our house up in Oregon. It's a, it's a good pipe wrench. <laughs> Not good looking, but good <laughs> uh, Other things that happened around here, again, as I got older, uh, I, uh, I helped Arthur more and more. Uh, there's pictures that you've seen in the files when I was two years old with a teddy bear holding the lawnmower uh, and helping him, but uh, that didn't uh, occur that way. I, uh, the more I was here, the more I got involved in doing things with him, whether it was taking a, something apart and fixing it or working on the water lines. Uh, there was a lot around here that had to be done. And uh, routine things like sweeping the front porch up above, which I, I got very good at. <clears throat> we used to blow the leaves, not with a blower, but with a hose and a nozzle. And if you do it right, you can hardly use any water. You just you know, spray it around and the leaves go fine. We had to do that regularly. Uh, raking up the leaves under the Martin Bay was a challenge then, not the challenge it is now. <laughs> and it was amazing how many leaves would come down in that era, but I, I can't imagine, uh, certainly now. A lot of trimming that used to occur, so we had big burn piles uh, out where the trailer used to be and uh, where the visitor center is. And periodically we would burn those. And uh, as any of you have been around here in Long Beach for a while, you know the weather is different. You used to have heavy fogs. 
And when you think about it, the Del Amo area, which now has industrial buildings, used to be farms. You had Bellflower and the, and, the, and the dairies. You had orange groves before you had Disneyland. You had Seal Beach, a lot of there. So you had very dense fogs. And we would always pick a very dense, foggy day to touch off the, the, the burn piles. And these were big ones. They'd be you know, from here to the wall there in terms of stuff. Uh, and so they were, it was a big bonfire, but, uh, and we'd, we would burn the fields too around, uh, around the fence line. We would set those on fire just to avoid having a, a fire that we didn't want in the summertime. And that was always fun because things turned up, uh, old shell casings and stuff that were remnants of times gone by here. That, uh, and we, I used to dig holes around here in pits and uh, uh, always curious what would turn up, a lot of bones. And, things of that nature as you might imagine this this dirt around here has lots of lots of stories uh, that uh, I'm sure if you really went and uh, looked at you would, you'd find in the house I was always doing something if I had spare time and I'm looking I have not seen the the parlor has been restored uh, since it's done it looks magnificent uh, I, I was thinking where the cabinet is there there used to be an old uh, Steinway uh, grand player piano and I played around with that and I got it working. And so I play that and that was kind of fun. And that cabinet's there is for the, the music rolls. That's what that was built for. Uh, to store the rolls for the player piano. And there's uh, in the wall there, there's a cabinet. Which is, it just looks like a regular cabinet. It's got real a lot of shelves on it and that was for the thing. I, and other things you used to do, I, I decided one day I should try walking around the, uh, the perimeter upstairs, which I did. <laughs> if I'd fallen off, I, I probably wouldn't be here today. <laughs> but, uh, you carefully do it, so you know, you do things, uh, fun, fun things that you have memories of, uh, uh, certainly on it. Uh, my father, uh, uh, because he was, had to draw maps of geological uh, strata and so forth, uh, brought his office over here, and in the dark room, where uh, we call it the dark room, it's the second one from the end down there, he set, set it up, so his office was there, so quite a bit of the time he was around, which was fun for Arthur, and fun for me too, in the sense if I needed to get a hold of somebody, and uh, so he, he uh, for until we really sold the house, he, he had his office for five or six years here on it, and uh, sometimes we would... Uh, I'd go home for lunch with him, and we had a 37 Willys sedan, which was just about my size when I was like 13 or 14, and there was nothing wrong with driving it on Virginia Road, turning right on Country Club, and going up a block on Locust, so I kind of learned how to drive uh, using that Willys, and of course there I could drive around the driveway here too a little bit, so it worked out pretty well, and uh, I had, had fun with it. So, and, and with Arthur, I used to, uh, not only work with him uh, during the summer a lot, and it was just a, it was fun doing it. I, I got to mow the front lawn. It'd take all day with the power mower to mow that front lawn. And, uh, and there was watering, and there was no end of things to do. And uh, at uh, lunchtime, we would hop in his car and, and go down to one of two places. Uh, in the early days, we went over to the Virginia Country Market for a hamburger. And that was the wooden country market right at the corner of Long Beach Boulevard and San Antonio Drive which uh, it was a big uh, farmer's type of thing and had booze and so on. And I think that by 1948 or 49 was on its way out. Uh, then we used to go down uh, to a Mods Cafe, which was uh, at, uh, I think, Willow in Atlantic across from Barnes and Delaney, and uh, used to eat down there. And all the oil field crews came in there, so it was kind of an interesting place. But uh, uh, lots of fun memories that, uh, that I had uh, certainly with, with Arthur and uh, around here and uh, uh, times that, uh, you know, you, you, you didn't want to see in, but obviously had to. Uh, coming up uh, in late 54, when the sale of the city was more or less uh, on, on track, uh, was a big clean out around here because the house essentially had been vacated uh, from living, but not vacated in terms of what was here. And so you had stuff at medicine cabinets and, you know, that sort of thing. It just had been left since 1944 there. And uh, I wish now uh, we, what we're doing here today would have uh, you know, we'd had access to some of the stuff that was here. Clothes, you were talking about getting clothes from that. My, my grandparents' clothes were just in the closet up there from who knows how far back. And, uh, and so uh, there was quite a, my grandmother and my mother in particular spent a lot of time out here 
figuring out what goes where and the goodwill and trucks came in out and ultimately it got emptied out. Fortunately, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a collector and I, there are a number of things that were going to get tossed out that I was happy to, to, to glom onto. Uh, for example, uh, my grandparents used to like to play with uh, jigsaw puzzles made out of wood, the old-fashioned ones. And I have them all still, because I got them out there. They were in the cabinet in the, in the library there, and they were going to get sent somewhere, and so I said, I'll send them to me. <laughs> and, uh, and so still have those, and uh, records. Uh, my grandfather liked opera records, so I, and the Masteritas has them in the collection now, because uh, I had two or three binders of the old Victor opera, opera records only on one side, great big discs and so forth, and, uh, and a whole host of other little odds and ends that over the years have come back to the Las Ritas. Uh, a recent one was the Rancho San Justo, uh, the print that's in the library there. So I'm, I'm happy that I've been able to return a lot to, to the Rancho here collection and, uh, and have them once again be in the appropriate place. And, uh, I, uh, I think I gave to Ellen maybe one, uh, a fun one was a copy of Harper's Weekly, I recall. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just the whole bound issue from the 1870s, but what had fun about it, it had an address labeled Jotham Bixby. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, again, that was just something I thought was fun to, to take and glommed onto. So uh, th those sorts of things have, uh, have got good memories, but also in the appropriate place now, certainly. After, uh, after we sold the place, uh, again, the, probably then the, the next phase started, and that's when the city took over, and uh, I got to know, know Mrs. White, who was the first curator, I think, and then Bill Evans, who was the curator, and spent quite a bit of time when I was around coming over and talking about this and that and so forth. But those were the slow days here in terms of, we used, they used to have exhibits right in here, and, and uh, you didn't have the volunteers, and, and it took quite a while for this to sort of get off the off the ground for the city to know what what to do with it and so on. But I think at that time, though, I started to get more and more interested in the family. Uh, obviously, this is a neat house, and uh, where did it come from, and why why did we get involved in it, and uh, how what other things were happening. And so, uh, from that point on, I've been digging into family history more or less and continually. It's never stopped. It seems like. Uh, I was fortunate, uh, I guess, uh, I, my, one of my first jobs was up in the Bay Area. I worked for Wells Fargo. And I was in the trust division, which gave me a good heads up on where to find all the state records. And uh, I spent two and a half, three days in the LA Hall of, Hall of Records looking at grandfather, great-grandfather Bixby's estate records. Because there were a lot of questions as to what happened. <coughs> and how did Flint Bixby and company uh, get dissolved and how did it uh, evolve into some other companies? And so some of those questions got answered. Uh, also, uh, I got fortunate in wondering about if there were any flints around down in Hollister, because of course the family was uh, up in, in Hollister with the ranch of San Justo. And I uh, made some phone calls, and lo and behold, the granddaughters of, of Thomas Flint were still in Hollister. Not only in Hollister, but they were living in the house that the Flint family moved to in 1912 when they left the the San Justo, and uh, Dorothy and Marjorie were uh, two uh, unmarried sisters that uh, had taught, uh, one of them had taught at the Webb School in Claremont, of all places, and that they, they retired up to the old family home, and on three or four occasions I went down to see them, and couldn't have been nicer, and they had all kinds of clutter around the house, it was fun, they gave me some pictures, and uh, they had some Bixby family pictures, they didn't know what to do with, so I, <laughs> I said, <laughs> I'm your man. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, after uh, I, I got to know their niece, who happened to have a dress store in Claremont. And as you might imagine, I went to Claremont, you know, Claremont Pomona College, where the families had a lot of connections. And I got to know the niece, and, and she knew where I fit into things. And uh, very nicely, when the last of the sisters passed away uh, in the early 80s, uh, called me. And I said, they have a, a desk there I would love. And that's the old flint desk that was made for the Rancho San Justo. And uh, she said, nobody in the family wants it. And, and literally that afternoon, I was in my pickup truck heading south. <laughs> and, uh, so I have that to this day. And ultimately, uh, that'll probably should be in the Las Rios because it, uh, 
it's it's very a very interesting old office desk. It was in the San Justo. It was the Flint Bixby desk, and uh, it even has Flint name on the side of it, written in pencil, where they had some measurements and so on, and a lot of other things. Uh, some of which have come back to the. Uh, the Las Rita's here, but uh, things that the other family didn't wish, and for example, the date stamp, uh, stamp for Flint Bixby and Company, mm -hmm. things that are just wonderful gadgets to have. So that started a whole bit of, uh, of uh, getting to know that family. I also got to know the grandson, great-grandson of Benjamin Flint, who lived in Hollister too. And so uh, I've, I've tried to reach out to, in a number of ways to learn what I can, and uh, I'm still at it. Uh, some of you uh, know I've written a few things, and uh, uh, I'm always trying to come up with an answer. And it's interesting uh, nowadays how how it's a lot easier in many ways to determine or to, to dig up history. It used to be uh, you'd have to go there, and you wouldn't know have any idea whether a newspaper had an article or not. You wouldn't know whether there's something uh, in the way of a book available. But now with the internet, it's absolutely amazing what you can turn up. Uh, the genealogy stuff, uh, you can go into the newspaper files and find stuff that you would never, ever uh, come across. Uh, crazy things like the, the school catalog back in, uh, in Maine with uh, my great-grandfather's name in it from 1842. You know, you'd never locate something like that in any other way. And uh, of course, just the internet itself uh, has uh, all sorts of things. So. I think digging into history is maybe easier than it, uh, than it ever was. <laughs> you, you, you think it's all been learned, but uh, you're learning more and more all the time. So uh, it's an interesting process, and uh, I've kind of defaulted the family history. Uh, uh, Sarah Bixby Smith's uh, uh, son, Arthur Maxon Smith, was kind of a family historian, and he started trying to sort out all the family because, as you, as you know, uh, some Hathaway daughters married some Bixby guys. <laughs> and, and there are a lot of confusing double relatives and so on. And he sorted that all out for the family because nobody in the family could figure out themselves how they related. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got curious about the companies. And so that, that led to, uh, you know, from one thing to another. And uh, I, I spent quite a bit of time over the years uh, down at uh, one of the family companies, the Bixby Land Company because they had a lot of things in it. And uh, one of the things I spotted 25 years ago, uh, I carefully made sure that when they put things away, it was sequestered. And a year or so ago, we got those records out. And uh, there's an old document that has come to the Las Ritas, which is going to get a little publicity here, I understand, before too long, uh, which is a, a handwritten appeal for the title from the 1850s. And uh, it's something that'll be, I guess, on display. Is that right? Before? Yes. It, the 166th anniversary of the document, it's June 11th, February? June 12th. June 12th. Yeah. It'll be on display in the library. Yeah. So uh, I, I've always been on the lookout for, for old, old documents and things of interest that tie into it. And uh, I've, you know, I've still got a stack at home that I'm going through. And gradually, we'll get back <laughs> in place here and so on. So. So anyway, that's where, you know, I, I, this has been a lifelong avocation, but uh, this particular house, uh, you know, has a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of memories for me in, in varying ways. Uh, those of you that have good eyesight have spotted my name probably on the, on the adobe walls, uh, right out by the front door there when I was at various heights, <laughs> and, and, uh, and so on. And there's only four of us that are still alive that have their name on that wall, so uh, you're lucky not one of them, so. So anyway, lots, lots of things to, to think about and remember, and again, uh, thinking about the appreciation, uh, certainly, of uh, everybody that makes the house what it is. And, uh, happy to keep contributing. I, uh, as I described to you, I was probably mowing lawns when I was 10 years old, and I'm still a volunteer. I'm on one of the committees now, and, uh, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, have done other things with Floyd and, and, and so forth, and uh, uh, I guess I'm maybe the record volunteer here. <laughs> it's, it's encompassed if anybody else has volunteered longer than 70 years let me know <laughs> so that, that's kind of uh, what I wanted to end up with if there are questions I'm happy to uh, answer any any questions you happen to have or anything like that uh, yeah oh, okay 
With so many of your family members here in Southern California, how did you wind up in Oregon? <laughs> well, that's a reasonable question. My wife went to Pomona College too, and, and there's your answer. <laughs> uh, and it, uh, we we moved up about uh, about 1972, 1973. And the fun thing about uh, her family is they've been in Oregon as long as the Pixbys have been out here. And, and the other fun thing is, uh, is that her great grandfather built a big, and it's big in a sense, but it really isn't too big, but a rather elaborate house on the hill uh, known as the Piddock Mansion. It's open to the public, it's owned by the city, it has a volunteer group just like here. It's, it is, it's, it's uh, exactly the same, same situation as the Lost Street. It's two very different houses. Uh, but uh, the same concept. So, so uh, but I, 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 I haven't lived in Long Beach really uh, since. Uh, uh, I hope I don't get on anybody, uh, anybody's nerves when I say I went to Poly High because there's probably some Wilson people there. <laughs> but I, uh, I graduated from Poly, and then after 1959, I have not lived full time in Long Beach. But try and get back down. There's been a little gap here recently, but I'm usually down periodically. Uh, yeah. I just wonder who developed. Did you develop the the number code for the family? No. Uh, there have been several questions about that. It, it may have gone back to uh, uh, Sarah Bixby Smith, uh, my great aunt, my grandfather's mm -hmm. sister. Uh, the usual credit is given to her son Maxon, oh. and it's just a question of. Uh, trying to have some numbering system so that you could figure out where the generations were. And, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a number three uh, uh, number, but now they're, f they're six and seven number kids if you get them down to the two-year-olds and so forth. Uh, but it helps sort things out. And uh, we've kept it going. When we get together now and then, a person will have a name tag, and they'll be, you know, one, two, one, four, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and it's helpful because you can uh, uh, you can tell whether you're a Jotham side of the family or a Llewellyn side, and, and you know where you fit in if you kind of work it backwards. So. But there's nothing magical about it. <laughs> just, just a simple numbering system. And, uh, and you know, there's been a lot of confusion with all the Llewellyns and all the Sarahs. Uh, our daughter is a Sarah Hathaway. Uh, you know. <laughs> so uh, there, there are a lot of them around. So uh, it, it is confusing, I think. Uh, and uh, you know, you get involved in other collateral families, the Westons, and go back further. And I, I've spent time back in the Weston home, in, uh, uh, back in Madison, Maine, uh, when it was still owned by the family. And that goes back, uh, part of the house goes back to the 1790s. And the fun thing about that, that house is that it had never been updated except for a little electricity and a little bit of water. Uh, we stayed in it back, uh, oh, probably the early 80s. And it was just like going back in the 1820s, just unbelievable in terms of uh, the furnishings, uh, the wallpaper, everything about it had never been updated by the family except, say, for uh, just a little power, you had a single light bulb you know, over the ceiling type of thing. But uh, there's a lot of family members. This, this family is, goes in all directions, and of course uh, uh, a dozen or so came out during the, the gold rush, you might say, and uh, some of them went back and other branches. So there's a, the family, if you really start exploring it, 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 it's a very huge family, as you might expect, <laughs> taking all the generations. But uh, the ones that have been here in Long Beach, uh, uh, you know, been pretty focused and so on, so we can keep track of them a little easier. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, when when you were here, when you were four or five, when yeah. you started kindergarten, where did you sleep? I that's a good question. I uh, I slept in the in what is now the blacksmith shop and was the blacksmith oh. shop. Uh, there was a two room suite there, Llewellyn's room, and then next to it, it was sort of a study, and my parents. Uh, took over the Wallen's room, which had a bathroom on it, and I had a better bed in there. They figured that would be an easy way to do it. It was convenient and so on. And uh, so that's, that's where I stayed. But other than that, we utilized the house just like you normally would and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious. There's a, uh, it's now a, a heritage park in Santa Fe Springs. It used to be a farm, and 
some of the buildings are still there and it was owned by the Hathaway family. I'm just curious if you know if there's any connection. That rings no bells relative to connection uh, because the Hathaway uh, really was from George, Reverend George Hathaway. Right. And, uh, uh, and it goes straight down to our family. There are some people who are Hathaway and there's somebody in town here who has a Hathaway relative that I uh, can't pull his name out. So that doesn't mean it isn't part of the, the larger family. And that's always an interesting question. Somebody says, well, you know, I'm a Bixby, are you related? And the answer is probably yes. Because <laughs> if you go back, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten generations, uh, the, the first Bixby came over here in the 1600s, uh, the answer is probably yes. But uh, the, the biggest question they get is Bixby Bridge. It's up uh, by Carmel on Highway 1. And uh, that guy had no relationship in the currents in, the, in, the, in, the, in a close sense to us. He just happened to come out, but he's a, a few generations up. He is a, he is a relative. <laughs> but, uh, that's, a, that's a question you get uh, fairly frequently. Are you related to the Bixby Bridge? And my granddaughter had her picture taken by <laughs> Bixby Bridge. She thought it was so cool. <laughs> yeah? The, the, care, the caretaker after the property was closed? Uh, Arthur retired, uh, and he lived over in a little apartment that was uh, where, close to where the firehouse is on, faces, a little apartment faces on, the, uh, I say, American Avenue, I say the Long Beach Boulevard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Arthur is an interesting person, and uh, just today I had a, an email from an orchard family member. Uh, Arthur came from a family back east. Uh, his parents were English. His father was killed, or I should better say is that died in an accident. Uh, when Arthur was five years old, Arthur was born in 1887, I think, in, in Brooklyn. And I've seen where he born, was born, my dad and I, when we were explorers. We went to Africa in 1953. We took a ship out of New York, and so we had to go over to Brooklyn to see where Arthur was born, and we did. Uh, but uh, Arthur uh, uh, grew up there, and after his father died, his mother remarried, they moved to Hackensack. Uh, Arthur had, a, I think, a, a problem with uh, you know, preliminary tuberculosis or something like that, and the, the doctors had the usual cure, get out, get out of the east, get to some better weather. And so Arthur worked his way across country, uh, and, and these are questions I wish I could have. Ar Arthur dribbled lots of stuff out to me, but I wasn't smart enough when I was eight or nine or ten years old to say, sit down, Arthur, and tell me about this. But he worked as a painter, he worked on a farm, uh, and he ultimately worked his way west. And uh, until a few years back, uh, from talking with Arthur, I've gathered he started working for the grandparents about 1928 or 29 down at the Ocean Avenue house. But I've turned up voting records that he was at the Ocean Avenue house in 1924. So, you know, I, I learned something about Arthur via the internet that, uh, <laughs> that uh, he, he never told me. Uh, not that he, you know, I could have asked him, I suppose, and pinned him down. But, uh, uh, he lived in the, uh, and that house used to be around, there's an apartment house there, but it was around in, in the 50s. And uh, after uh, the, the Rancho here was restored, Arthur came out, and uh, he's, uh, I understand, not the longest term, term tenant here, but uh, almost maybe. He went from 1931 to 1955, and, uh, you know, was, he had assistance during the 30s when things were a little more active, and then basically on his own. The rest of the time took care of the place, and you can imagine it was a big job. But he had the routine down, and that's where I fit into the picture. I, I, I took a, a load off of him when I could, because I enjoyed it, so he didn't have to mow the lawn, or he didn't, <laughs> or, or he didn't have to sweep, or he didn't have to do something, and he could do something else. But uh, Arthur was a very smart guy. Was, uh, he had a, a brother that was uh, executive with Batten, Barton, Durston, and Osborne, the, the advertising people uh, and, uh, and several other uh, family members that you know were fairly active in the business world. But uh, Arthur was totally self-taught, but always interesting. He was a, a person that 
had things to say about something. And so I would come here and he said, I was reading down at the library yesterday about this or that. And so he would tell me about you know, the latest something or other. So Arthur is a very curious person and inherently one of those people that didn't have a, a, a major education but was inherently a very intelligent individual and a, a delightful person in that regard. And so he essentially uh, became part of the family and I, I honestly say he became my substitute grandfather in many, many ways uh, because of that. And, and to this day, there are things that I do because of him, uh, one of his sayings, because you, if you get out by the well for the pump house over there, the, the tank, and you need the saw, and the saw is back over in the garage, you got to walk back and get it. So he was always saying, "Use your head and save your heels." <laughs> it's, uh, it's very correct. And, you know, I, that, that to this day, uh, uh, I, I, you know, I think about that. If I'm going to go do something, take everything you need. Uh, before you have to come back and get it again. And even on our present house, I do that. If I'm going into the backyard, I take what I have. And uh, he had a certain way of sweeping that he wanted you to do. You, you push the broom, a push broom, and then you tamp it, and then you, you know, shake it out and keep on going and so on. And my brother mentioned to me just a f uh, short time ago, a year or two ago, that he sweeps in the same way that Arthur taught him. You know, so our Arthur had lots of little ways of doing things that, that somehow I think I have picked up from him. And uh, uh, after the house was sold, so he, he retired uh, uh, from uh, obviously active work and uh, got a little, a little apartment and lived there the rest of his life until uh, 1961, I guess it was. And uh, I used to see him when I came home from college and so forth. Uh, I'd always stop in, my dad would see him. Uh, uh, he would come over for dinner quite frequently. Uh, just because he enjoyed a good meal and we enjoyed having him around. So he really was part of the family. And uh, I, I want to give him his due around here because he was really a very important person in many respects in terms of the longevity that he had here. And he had his Model A and, and, uh, and that always intrigued me. And uh, one of the places that we went, uh, I mentioned to you, the cafe, Mod's Cafe down uh, for lunch, there was a chap that lived uh, off of Wardlow Road that had a 1914 Model T that he drove as his regular car. And he used to come to lunch too. And that got me interested in Model T's. And when I was at Pomona College, I drove a 1915 Model T. <laughs> <laughs> dated my wife in it. <laughs> so uh, so uh, Arthur Say is a person that uh, deserves to be remembered around here. And uh, I have in the works uh, just a narrative that I've written up about him. Uh, just so that we get it in the record, what I know about him and uh, what I remember from him, just because that's one of those things where I have probably the closest memory of Arthur of anybody nowadays. And, uh, people like my cousin Jean and Barr knew Arthur, but they didn't spend the uh, copious amount of time that uh, I did with him. So, so he's an interesting, interesting person, certainly. Uh, yeah? You mentioned the Ocean House. Uh, whereabouts on Ocean was that house? Yeah. Oh, 1600 and something ocean. Uh, a few blocks before Bixby Park down there. Uh, uh, and it was on the, I'm trying to think the street, and I can't bring out what the street is, but uh, uh, an old two story house that uh, my grandparents moved to in 1905 uh, and uh, lived there until 1931. Uh, the streetcar used to come along Ocean Avenue in those days, so it was a good location. My grandfather worked downtown. Uh, we have a number of pictures of the house, and they expanded the house uh, in 1915 or so, made it a little bit bigger. Arthur uh, lived in an apartment above the garage, and his job then was the cars and the yard and fixing faucets and anything else that needed to be done, and uh, so became part of the family down there. And my, my parents were married in that house, and then uh, after the 30s, it ultimately was sold and turned into multiple apartments. And it survived until the 50s. And then now there's a multi-story condominium of some sort on that property. And there are a number of Bixby homes that were around that here, and I, I chatted about that with the family a couple of years ago. We had, you know, the, you had the George, Bixby's house at uh, it's now Melinda Drive, which is still around and a grand and glorious house to say the least, still. And then uh, uh, 
Amelia lived down on Sunrise Drive, which is down by the current seaside down there, had a house, and various other, and Jotham uh, had, had the big house down by, uh, uh, across from Bixby Park that uh, got sort of dismantled during the earthquake in 33. And of course, my uncle did, and you know, we lived down August. So I've been a lot of the family at one time or another. And you know, the, uh, some of the old houses, even Jotham's first house, is still around. Not in, not in the shape of, of where it used to be. It used to be downtown off of Ocean Avenue, which uh, the house that dates from the 80s is now on Fourth Street or something out by Recreation Park or uh, the little pond out there, and it's been sliced and diced. And only if you know what the original house looked like do you realize it's the same house. Uh, there's a few pieces there <laughs> that you, you realize are the original house. Uh, but that's one of the oldest houses in Long Beach, and of the Bixby houses, that's one of the very oldest that's still around. Uh, anything else? Okay. No? Now's your chance. <laughs> okay. All right. It's been fun to chat, and hopefully I've covered a few things. I haven't told you anything too much that, about old history and so on, but a little bit about being out in this wondrous place. And again, my thanks that you make it and keep it as wondrous as it always was. And uh, I think we're making progress. And we've got some good projects going now. To, uh, we've got the trailer going. It had uh, about a few things in there. And that's, that's the biggest thing to me is get the storage trailer gone. But we're working on alarm systems. And we've got this restored. And the water's going on. So a lot's, uh, lots happening around. Thing that I want to see happen is have this house stay around for the next 200 years and yeah. try to do my best to make that happen. Yeah. <laughs>